Hey everybody, welcome back to Smart Mouth. Guess what? I'm excited that there is Smart Mouth merch now. You can find it at smartmouthpodcast.com. It's pretty cool stuff if I if I do say so myself. Uh, as always, there is a Patreon too. That is at patreon.com slash smartmouthpodcast. You can contribute to it for just a dollar a month, which is 25 cents an episode, which I think is worth it. <laughs> Thank you to listener Anna Grisevich for increasing her Patreon pledge. That's awesome. Very kind. Links to the merch and the Patreon are in the show notes. Today's guest is Nick Cho, but first, we have an advertisement. Friends, are you familiar with Quark? It's a dairy product that's super popular in European and Central Asian diets. It's technically a soft cheese, but Quark more closely resembles a really thick yogurt, and you can eat it plain. I think it makes a great breakfast because it's super filling, and it has up to 24 grams of protein in every eight ounces. And also, it doesn't separate when it gets hot, so you can use it in cooking and baking, too. A brand called Wunder has been selling it in the United States, so if you'd like to try it, go to wundercreamery.com and enter code SMARTMOUTH for 15% off on your first order. That's wundercreamery.com. Use code SMARTMOUTH. I'm emphasizing the Wunder because it's like wonder, but with a U, not an O. Back to Nick Cho. He is the co-founder of Wrecking Ball Coffee Roasters, and he's an absolute coffee expert. Uh, He's also the TikTok personality known as Your Korean Dad. Millions of views. And he only started it like a few months ago. That's been unexpected for him. And now on to the show. My wife and I are considered leading experts in the coffee industry worldwide. We do a lot of teaching and speaking. Uh, I'm more on the brewing barista, kind of like more the consumer end of things. And she's more on the roasting, the the green, like the raw coffee sourcing and like the professional tasting side. Then both of us do a lot of commentary on the industry in general and like a lot of analysis and stuff like that. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Can you explain the coffee harvest though? Or is that totally her domain? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, tell me tell me exactly what happens because it seems like a multi-step process. In terms of the harvesting part? Yeah. Well, coffee, you know, it's funny. Like years ago, we'd, you'd ask people like, where does coffee come from? And the most common answer like in the late 90s was literally like Seattle. Coffee grows in Seattle, obviously, because that's where <laughs> Starbucks is, you know, kind of thing. As As the past few decades have progressed, people have been learning more about where their food and drink comes from as well as have been showing more and more curiosity. So that all said, like coffee is the seed of a fruit. And in fact, it's like inside of this, it's like the, the center of the seed. In a lot of ways, if you imagine like a peach and you have the peach pit, like if there was a thing that you could roast, grind up and drink and brew and drink inside of the peach pit, I mean, in a way like that's, your coffee bean and every coffee bean i should say most coffee beans have two it's almost like the two like halves of a brain or the two halves of a peanut the way that they kind of coexist the two of them there are exceptions i won't get into that but (laughs) they they grow coffee grows all over the place there's also the places where coffee grows that are sort of the most celebrated and most prized. And so that's places between the tropics, the Tropic of Cancer and, Cap- and Capricorn, like around the equator. And then you need it sort of like at a certain elevation because that sort of warm days and cool nights create a slower maturation of the, of the fruit itself, which in turn leads to more sweetness. And sweetness is always a good thing. Maybe we'll talk about this more later. But it takes about five years for a coffee tree to mature to the point where it can start to produce coffee fruit that in turn is like harvestable and you could sell as coffee beans. And the general sort of rule of thumb that people throw around is that one tree will produce about a pound a year. Oh, that's not a lot. Yeah. And that's in in finished product. And so there's a lot of loss in, in between. And so, yeah, it's a very labor intensive sort of proposition. Because things are growing at elevation, it tends to be on hills and mountains, and you can't have big picking machines on hills and mountains. So it's all done by hand. We talk a lot about how with coffee, 
by the time it reaches your cup, just it's been touched by like five to 20 hands, like every single bean, like individually in some form or another. Yeah. And so coffee has different crop cycles depending on the country and, and different sort of geography. I mean, even Colombia, like one of the most prized coffee growing countries is long and sort of like thin shaped as a country, the geography. And so it actually has two crop cycles, interestingly enough, because of the geography. But, you know, during the course of the year, um, you'll have different different countries sort of come into uh, come into season so to speak but that fruit has inside like inside the skin like the outer layer so the outside layer kind of looks almost like a cranberry like a big cranberry and then right. right under there is a very thin layer of fruit and that fruit kind of like the closest thing to me it resembles is almost like a kiwi or a grape type sort of flesh like this sort of slimy flesh like we call that mucilage and then under that is, I, I'm always uh, with the analogies, under that is a shell that's sort of like a very light, uh, a very weak like, pistachio shell. And that's, uh, and that's the, what we call parchment, like paper. It's a parchment layer. And inside of that is our trusty coffee bean sitting there all lonely, waiting to be ground up, pulverized. <laughs> so... When you say that there's five to twenty hands touching your each bean of your coffee, that makes me think that it should be a very expensive product. But I know that there's sort of a common trope in the U.S. to say something like four dollars, yeah, for a cup of drip coffee. How do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that. There's a lot of tension there. I think that when people complain about the cost of coffee. They're talking about a few things. I think that they're just talking about like, to some degree they talk about inflation, right? But then on top of that, it just feels like, you know, when things get more expensive, whether it's a gallon of milk or a gallon of gas or anything, it feels a little bit like what's happening in the world. But the fact is that coffee is actually getting cheaper, which is, you know, against the rate of inflation from the 1970s, coffee's gotten cheaper, which is not okay <laughs> because in a lot of ways coffee's gotten better and we know more about the world but like through globalization and a lot of trade practices it's actually gotten cheaper in a lot of ways but you know when people are used to like remembering back in the day the 25 cent cup of coffee bottomless cup of coffee at a diner kind of situation then you know it is hard to think about and fathom like a five dollar cup of coffee but when you do all the costs and you put it all together, you know, and you sort of ask people, well, you know, if this is how much labor it takes to produce this, then how much labor, you know, how much should those people be paid per hour, per pound, you know, harvest, et cetera, et cetera. You put it together, like $5 is still kind of cheap. Yeah. I have a whole thing about how food should be expensive, but also wages should be high and cost of living should be low. So it's just all a mess. Yeah, it it is a big mess. And yeah, yeah, we're talking about the crop side of things. We're not even talking about the sort of barista wage side of things as well, which is a big issue. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you just totally established your credentials as a coffee expert for this episode for the audience. But I also wanted to mention that you're now TikTok famous for a character. Would you call him a character? It's your Korean dad. Is it you or is it a character? It's a good question. I think of it as a persona, I guess. I think of it as a facet of me. It's sort of like a filtered version. You know, being a cisgender man in 2020, even though I'm Korean, I don't necessarily wear makeup. But in a way, like I think of it that way. It's like my makeup. It's me putting my thing on and trying to be and portray a nice, caring, wholesome dad. I've asked my, I have two teenage daughters. They're 15 and 17. You know, I kind of did the, the reality check thing with them. Like, <laughs> you know, how do you feel about it? Like, how would you answer if someone asked, like, is that how he is in real life? And they said, well, like, you know, obviously it's, it's a facet, but uh, it does reflect kind of who I am. It's just the best version of that, I guess. And I've, you know, I, I follow you on Twitter. So I've seen you just your astonishment and how much it's blown up. And you, I mean, how do you even predict something like that? I, I don't know that you can. You know, I think that there is, it's kind of considered gauche to say that like, I want to be famous, right? And and we criticize that kind of thing. I think that apparently it's it's not okay to say you want to be famous. It's okay to want to be famous and just not say it, 
but you know there is that kind of validation i guess that human inclination you want it's mostly about validation it's like if a lot of people think i'm cool then i must be doing something right yeah and as much as it's really hard to gain that kind of thing it's also sort of easy like once you start gaining it it compounds and therefore it almost gets easier as it grows to some degree and and therefore it's almost it's not addicting in the literal sense but it has those qualities i think that makes a lot of sense because i know that a lot of the feedback has been just sort of like i don't know how seen a lot of young people feel by your korean dad yeah it's been really interesting i mean at its core my whole thing was like, I just wanted to portray like a nice dad, like your Korean dad is a nice dad. And the Korean part, I, I have a lot to say and a lot of thoughts about a lot of things, but specifically about um, just the idea of race and culture and cultural background and what that means in America and America specifically. Is that coffee you're drinking right now? This, so I had my coffee, I, I can show you cause we're on the Zoom. So this was my cappuccino I made. Um, <laughs> And then this, interestingly enough, it looks like coffee, but it's not. This is black ginseng tea oh. that I made. Black ginseng is the rarest ginseng. It's, it's, I don't want to get into it too much, but it's steamed and dried like a number of times. And the regular ginseng like dries up. It gets really concentrated. And there's some changes that it goes through. Some kind of like mysterious mystic arts of the East, <laughs> uh, which I don't. I don't know all of it, but it's supposed to be good for you. And ginseng is very, also very Korean. And I've been taking to drinking this after my coffee each day. And it, I don't know. It, I've, I feel like it makes me feel better. And it's supposed to be a, what do you call it, boost your immune system as well. So. Well, you know, that is sort of interesting that you, like aside from the fact that you're in the coffee industry, that you are a drinker of both coffee and tea. Most people, I think, prefer one or the other. And even like macro, it said that like coffee is the hot drink of Europe and the Americas and tea is everywhere else in the world. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, yeah, but this is, again, part of the beauty of being American, right? It's like we yes. get to pick and choose. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My family and I immigrated when I was like one and a half. I see. Uh huh. So, it, you know, that immigrant experience, I, I always say that like for people who aren't immigrants that people think about the immigrant experience as like a journey from another place to the US. That's not the immigrant experience. The immigrant experience is like living here and trying to figure stuff out. And for that matter, even the children of immigrants have their own immigrant experience where you know, you're trying to understand the world when your parents are like strangers in a strange land and they're, they're happy and comfortable being strangers in a strange land. And for you, you're like, I can't do that. I can't pretend that I'm a visitor here. Like I have to act like I, I figure out what it means to be just as American as everybody else and feeling like your parents aren't really able to help you in that way because that wasn't their experience. Like all these sorts of things, all these wow. sorts of things. And those are things that are I've never heard anyone talk about in American culture. And again, like that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think there's so much of our sort of collective and individual experiences that are meaningful and that there's a lot to learn from that, that I'm excited to have the opportunity to shed a light on. Yeah, absolutely. It's very cool. The whole phenomenon is very cool. Were you interested in coffee, like on just on a personal enjoyment level first, or did you get into it as a business first? It's a great question. I was not a coffee drinker when I first opened my first coffee shop. Uh, it's been almost 20 years since I opened my first place. It was called Murky Coffee. It's in Washington, D.C. For people who know Washington, D.C., it's on Wisconsin Avenue in the heart of Georgetown. Yeah, every so often you would see, like, one time I remember seeing Bill Clinton just walking up the street and him kind of looking at me. <laughs> uh, he was going from something to something else, uh, back then, like in 2002 or three. But at the time I was with my ex-wife, uh, my kid's mom, uh, my wife, Trish now is my, we're each other's second marriage. But at the time I was a grande mocha, no whipped cream from Starbucks <laughs> guy. And I liked the grande mocha because it didn't taste that much like coffee. Right. Yeah. And what really got me into coffee was realizing that I would have a bar, except I don't want to deal with like the unintended consequences of alcohol, you know, so to speak, the unpleasant parts of it. But I like that social sort of gathering place kind of, kind of dynamic. And so a coffee shop made a lot of sense. 
And then as I started researching a little bit, I came to find that there's a geeky side, a sciencey side to it that I could really take, take to as well and that I could wrap my brain around and ultimately sort of help make things better than they would be otherwise. And once I got started, it was fascinating because, you know, for me, it was very much like I want to give people good things because everyone deserves it. And that was the motivation behind like really delving into coffee and trying to make it and to perfect it as best that I can. And ultimately led to being connected to other people who were like-minded. And, you know, a few years later, all of a sudden I'm like, oh shoot, I'm like, you know, sort of part of the leading edge, sort of the leading minds, the thought leaders in the coffee industry on the specialty side. Like, I don't know if you've heard about the term, like the term third wave coffee. Yes. Yeah. So my wife, Trish, coined that like invented the idea of third wave coffee oh wow yeah and so it's a thing and actually like she was the one who originated it in the industry i was the first one to bring it mainstream into like mainstream media in an interview i did with npr that was 2005 and then it kind of started to spread you know through through media and pop culture and there was a time where we would kind of notice every time there was a media hit and there came a point at which it was like too much you know there's like it became part of the lexicon for especially for food related people yeah yeah being part of that kind of leading edge has been such a thing yeah that sounds amazing and also it is a, like a sort of unusual point in coffee's history that it's getting <laughs> written about so much because I think coffee is sort of considered a staple like it's part of rations in the military when you like learn about the pioneers it was always something they took with them along with the flour um, but there actually isn't much written about coffee until fairly recently in history and I'm I'm thinking that that is could at least be partially due to the fact that it um, grows wild in Africa, where in a lot of the cultures there have more of a verbal tradition than a written tradition. So it takes a while to get to the the cultures that write everything down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, for us, it's like at times, especially with like the pinky up sort of fancy coffee people, we get, end up getting compared to wine a lot. Because ah. like wine is this sort of aspirational thing. Like wine is respected, it's beloved, and you know, people understand the value of it. No one questions like the, I mean, maybe a little bit, but no one questions like a $50 bottle of wine, really. Whereas like, like you were saying before, like $5 cup of coffee, like, are you kidding? You know, kind of thing. But the fact is that, the, you know, one of the big differences, there's a lot of differences, there's a lot of similarities, but one of the big differences is that coffee grows in very poor countries. You know, we're, we're, we're not talking about Bordeaux, France. Right. We're talking about Oromia, you know, Ethiopia. And, yeah, which is know. where coffee is native to. It's what is now Ethiopia. Right. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, the, the trade of coffee and how it spread around the world is they're, they're pretty fun to read about. Um, I don't retain all the details, but like literally people like sneaking plants in their coat and like jumping on a ship and like the movie version is like they look at it and they're like, ha, 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 I got the coffee plant, you know, kind of thing. And then replanting it somewhere else. Um, there's a ton of obviously like colonization history. Like for instance, the, the legendary Kopi Luwak coffee, the cat poop coffee, you've heard of this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, like that's the thing that, you know, there's stuff like that. There's like Jamaican Blue Mountain. Like there's all these sort of like, you know, said in hushed tones kind of varieties of coffee. Like the, the cat poop coffee, it's called Kopi Luwak. It's coffee that was consumed by a, a civet. It's sort of like a weasel that's native to, to Southeast Asia. And it poops out the, the coffee because it's the seed like we we're talking about. And then they would like wash it, roast it and, and brew it. And it was really good. I have a lot to say about this too. But, but I guess the reason I bring it up is that people are like, oh my God, that's a, an amazing coffee. It's legendary. It's like $300 a pound sometimes. You know, it's super rare. Well, the origins of that coffee have everything to do with enslavement of Indonesian people by the Dutch colonists. And the fact that the Dutch were exporting the coffee and no one was allowed to have any because it was an export good. Like, you know, those slaves and enslaved people were not worthy of drinking any of that. So they started drinking the poop coffee. And then it turned out that at the time, going through the digestive tract of the, of the, the animal helped sort of like process the coffee better than the regular ways that it was being done. 
Today, it's completely irrelevant. You know, today it's like, you know, we don't need leeches and stuff like that to do science. You know, we have other, we have the technology to do other things. But the fact is that the processing through the poop at the time was actually, it sounds crazy, but it's true, was a better method for a number of different reasons than the ways that people are processing it now. Nowadays, it's un, like unnecessary. Like there's really great processing everywhere around the world. So the cat poop thing is kind of kind of silly. I see. Yeah, it does make sense with the enzymes and whatnot that it would help process the coffee through the system. The, as we said, the coffee bean has a layer of fruit around it and the fruit has sugar. And that sugar, as with anything, likes to get moldy and rot. And so kind of managing that is actually pretty tricky to try to get something and, and have it be not fully shelf stable, but be able to kind of hold it for a certain amount of time. So drying it out and getting that fruit stuff off before it gets moldy and rots is a big part of the processing. But back in the day, they didn't worry about that stuff. Right. <laughs> like during Black Plague times or whatever, it's like they weren't worried about that shit, you know, so... There's also lots of wild stories about how it was that humans came to drink coffee. And I think that they're mostly fake, but they're usually something along the lines of Ethiopian goat herders in the like 800s noticed that when their goats would eat the red berries, which are the cherries of the coffee, that they would get all hyped. Yes. <laughs> And so they said, oh, I want to get hyped too. And then that they, someone brought them to monks and monks said, no, we don't like these. Throw them in the fire. And then they realized it smelled good and then they wanted it. Like none of that happened. Come on. <laughs> but those are popular stories. Yeah. It's like the mythical founding of Rome, Romulus and Remus kind of thing, right? Yes, exactly. And again, something I mentioned in this show a lot is that one of the ways that you can know for a fact that it's not a true story is if it doesn't show up until a thousand years after it is said to have happened, which is the the case in this coffee story. <laughs> and, you know, the original, original sort of coffee consumption was sort of in the form of like a power bar, you know, so to speak, taking the coffee bean, the coffee cherries and kind of mashing them together with other stuff that they were eating and eating it that way. And that indeed, like the, the, the caffeine was, um, you know, you kind of felt the caffeine. There's a lot of caffeine in that fruit layer as well. It's just that most of the time we don't access it. A lot of the, for instance, like when you see caffeine in a thing that doesn't normally have it, whether it's Coca-Cola or like some kind of energy drink that has caffeine in it, that caffeine comes from very often the decaffeination process. The byproduct of decaffeination is now you have all this caffeine you can sell. Oh, interesting. And then also there is some industry that's working on kind of reclaiming some of that caffeine from some of the byproducts of processing itself at the beginning. So some of that fruit stuff as well. If Coca-Cola, if cocaine were legalized and Coca-Cola decided to come out with a limited edition original recipe, would you try it? Wow, that's a good question. I think if, it, if people said it was safe, I would try it. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I've never tried cocaine, so I don't know. It's actually awful. I don't know how people can do it more than once. You feel so humiliated in the moment. You cannot believe your own behavior, but you can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my non-cocaine life, so I don't know what that would be. Um, yeah. <laughs> you don't need more of that? Yeah, I don't need more of that. So coffee is an Ethiopian product, but Yemen actually was where it really popped off. And I just realized that I could do 500 episodes about monasteries' role in the invention of food products because it was Sufi monasteries in Yemen that really like made, it, made roasting and brewing coffee into an art form for the first time. And this was in like the 1300s-ish, that era, late medieval period. There are a lot of people in Yemen who want to claim that coffee originates from Yemen, which wow. is one of those things. It's very f clearly fake news, but for them, like that's how important coffee is to Yemen as a culture and to some degree as an economy, that there is a sort of like myth that it actually originates there and that the Ethiopia thing is some kind of big conspiracy hoax. Oh, no. That does explain why the Yemen government has an entire separate coffee website. <laughs> it doesn't say, I don't think, that 
coffee comes originally from Yemen, but it is all about the history. It's actually like a really involved history. Um, they do say that for 200 years, again, like late medieval, early Renaissance, Yemen was the only place growing coffee commercially. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, in, in most of the world where coffee grows, there is as many as like 200 varieties, maybe 300 varieties of coffee, like subspecies of the coffee plant that are grown and cultivated because it was, it, they don't, they didn't, you know, uh, uh, originate there in Ethiopia. It's in the thousands. It's like 3000 something different varieties that are found. And a lot of them are sort of quote unquote undiscovered varieties. And so it, in Yemen, it's something in between, but that's one of the ways that they know that it came from Ethiopia. Oh yes. That makes a lot of sense. Although Yemen does have the town of Mocha. Yes. Which is pretty interesting that I, I actually, I mean, I don't know how it happened over history that mocha, people started saying mocha coffee because it came, not because it was grown in mocha, because that's where all the ships set sail from carrying it. And now mocha specifically is a coffee chocolate mix. Right. Right. So you have the port of mocha and then you have the port of Java in mm. Indonesia. Yeah. And so then you get things like mocha Java. And then eventually, I think that people like just with the mocha, I, I'm not actually sure how it turned into. I do think that somebody just like thought that it was a cool idea and then the thing stuck. That makes you know, sense. These things, hap these things happen from time to time. Like even like things like why is the caramel macchiato at Starbucks called the macchiato when macchiato is already a thing? It's like the literal answer is because it sounded good. <laughs> yeah. It sounded yummy. Like, you know, that's how the, a lot of these things start. So my dad would always call just like mugs of just diner level coffee, mocha java. I don't know where he got that. But he'd be like, oh, give me a cup of mocha java. Yeah. Yeah. It was a okay. specific, it was a specific blend and it was a popular one um, because, yeah, because it's just like blending those two things. And also, it, as you can imagine, with the coffee trade, there was this sort of idea of like exotic, especially back in the day. You know, we don't necessarily think of coffee as being exotic, at least not like in the second wave sort of Starbucks era. Maybe before that, I should say, like in the MJB kind of like Folgers era, it wasn't really marketed as being exotic. But before that, it really was like these are coming from faraway places, you know, Sinatra singing like there's a whole lot of coffee in Brazil and things <laughs> like that. Yeah. Like, where it was coming from was really important. Then it became less important, but more commodified, as you mentioned, like during World War II and such. And then kind of that that sort of exotification kind of stuff started coming back again. So, you know, that's interesting because that's been sort of the history of coffee in the Western world is sometimes being like, no, that's what Muslims drink. And other times being like, ooh, very exotic. And it just switches back and forth constantly. Yeah, I think that throughout human history, there's really interesting, I should say co coffee, coffee related human history during, during the sort of coffee era, so to speak, if we're going to call it that. The human being's relationship to coffee has always been interesting, and especially vis-a-vis -vis caffeine. You know, we tend to think about the idea of sitting with someone, having a cup of coffee, talking about brainy politics or like whatever, as a pretty modern phenomenon. It's not like that's that's like what the Ethiopians were doing 300 years ago. There's something about coffee that makes people want to just mansplain everyone <laughs> around them. Because it's associated with mansplaining, actually, because as you just re alluded to the coffee houses, which I think people think of like specifically Vienna, but also London and Paris. But the coffee house tradition in the sense of men sitting around and having big ideas, but actually just playing checkers, that does come <laughs> from North Africa and the Middle East. Yeah, men sitting around and 80% of the time they're just talking about why there shouldn't be women there. Yeah, exactly. It's very important to them. <laughs> so yeah, at first when coffee became commercialized, it was primarily just something in the Muslim world. And even when the British and the Dutch trading companies came to Yemen and started trading there in Mocha, they did buy coffee, but most of it went to other places in the Middle East. It took a while before Western Europeans cared about it. And then, of course, jumping ahead a lot, the reason why coffee is so ubiquitous in America is because during the Revolutionary War, people stopped drinking tea. On purpose. Right, right, yes. for sure. <laughs> you know, and, and people think about British being a tea drinking culture uh, in the UK and, and such. 
But that's also relatively modern phenomenon as well. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say modern, but you know, a thing that happens in history and in culture that isn't, I think, discussed enough, maybe because of just like the way that, again, men tend to like to write the history books is the idea of things being in fashion or trendy, you know? So coffee was just, you know, a thing big time in the UK, but it fell out of fashion because it became equated with sobering up. Yes. And so all of a sudden, like by default, tea became the drink of aristocrats and nobility and people who are a little bit more fancy. And therefore, like when that shift happened in, in the Americas, it was it was more than just about Boston Tea Party kind of thing. It was also a little bit like thumbing their nose at that sort of cultural um, way of being. Right, right. It was like a marker of your identity, whether you were drinking tea or coffee. It said everything about you. And we're going to call it soccer instead of football, jerks. Like, yeah, it was like that. <laughs> oh, so petty. So much pettiness. A lot of pettiness. <laughs> Hey, let's talk about Quark, specifically the cultured dairy product called Quark. It's very creamy. It's not tart at all. It's high in protein and low in lactose. And Quark is a staple in European and Central Asian diets. It's technically a soft cheese because it's made with a blend of cheese and buttermilk cultures. But Quark more closely resembles like a thick yogurt. I personally eat it like yogurt usually for breakfast or a snack, but you can also use it like sour cream, cottage cheese, creme fraiche, things like that in either sweet or savory recipes, cold or hot. A brand called Wunder has been pioneering quark in the U.S. and they make it in rural western Pennsylvania using milk only from cows raised on small dairy farms. So if you'd like to try some Wunder Quark, go to Wunder Creamery. That is like wonder, but with a U. Wunder Creamery and enter code SMARTMOUTH, one word, for a 15% off discount on your first order. That's WunderCreamery.com. Use code SMARTMOUTH. So as we mentioned, coffee houses were everywhere um, in the Middle East and North Africa in the 1500s. So it wasn't about another 100, 150 years until there was a trend in Europe, a craze even, if you will, for drinking coffee. But I think as with- A buzz. Us, yes, a buzz. Ha ha ha. I think when that happens, it's often young people leading the charge and a lot of older people get very uncomfortable. A couple different reasons. One of them actually makes a little bit of sense to me. And you know, Vienna is a hotbed of coffee drinking and has been since the late 1600s. But that's when Turkish troops came in and took over Vienna and brought coffee with them. And so it's like <laughs> some pros, some cons of that. I think some people didn't want to drink coffee for the same reason that some new Americans didn't want to drink tea. You know, war. <laughs> <laughs> you know. War, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but some of it was just older people getting upset at this new, fangled, addictive product that their children were drinking. So much so, this was such a, a talked about phenomenon that Bach wrote a coffee cantata, which I tried to figure out what cantata was. And it's essentially, it it's a musical piece written for voices. So a song, but a really long one. So somewhere between a song and in an opera yeah he wrote one he wrote the coffee cantata at zimmerman's coffee house in a town called leipzig and i would really like to read some of the lyrics to you if i may let's hear it the story is about a teenage girl who wants to drink coffee and her father says no she says (laughs) (laughs) a conversation that continues to this day She says, Father, but do not be so harsh. harsh. If I couldn't three times a day be allowed to drink my little cup of coffee, in my anguish, I will turn into a shriveled up roasted goat. And then in terms of dating, she says, no suitor is to come to my house unless he promises me, and also it's written into the marriage contract, that I will be permitted to make myself coffee whenever I want. Wow. I didn't know that part of the coffee cantata. Really? Yeah, it's just one of those things. There's actually coffee shops called Coffee Cantata here and there. There's actually one here in San Francisco. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I know it exists, but I, I've actually never taken the time to like really listen to it. And I'm a, I was a music major in college. You asked before about what I studied. Um, <laughs> and I have not put those two things together yet. Listening to different versions of it all morning, it's a charming little piece. <laughs> yeah, the Cardi B version is the best version by far. <laughs> yeah. 
She should do one. She'd, she'd have a fun take on it. <laughs> So another thing with these coffee houses and the big ideas that were being discussed in them is that they were very threatening to various government leaders at various times. The governor of Mecca in 1511, he wanted to ban coffee specifically because he heard rumblings of people trying to vote him out were starting in the coffee houses. Mm. He was afraid of, of what people were saying about him. Voter suppression. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What was his version of the uh, Four Seasons landscaping? <laughs> Whatever place you want makes you wonder. <laughs> I know. How did shenanigans go down 500 years ago? <laughs> Fascinating. It happened again um, in England in the 1670s when Charles II had a very tenuous grip on the throne. He tried to ban coffee as well because he knew that's where people would get together and plot how to return to a republic, as it had been. I mean, when you think about it, it's like with coffee, you know, it's it's partly, of course, like the stimulant of caffeine, and it just kind of makes you want to talk, I guess. There's also There's also the idea that like, when you're eating, your mouth is full. So it's harder to like really talk about stuff. Interesting. Whereas when you're drinking something, it's a little bit like a sip and then you talk and then you take a sip a few minutes later kind of thing. You know, and, and in a lot of ways, I think that for human behavior, it's like having that sort of, I almost want to call it like that excuse of like, we're just drinking coffee, you know, kind of thing. Like it helps to um, facilitate and be a catalyst for a lot of that kind of stuff, like that kind of conversations and stuff. That phrasing is making me laugh because there's a coffee shop in Paris called Procope, and that is where the French Revolution was planned. (laughs) So it's like Robespierre sitting there being like, I'm just drinking coffee, and also the guillotine seems cool. (laughs) Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, I love it. (laughs) There have been times when coffee was banned in the same way that like alcohol is banned because it's a substance. But as you said, sometimes literally it's associated with being sober, sort of almost like a replacement addiction. Yeah. And and one that, again, like like so many things in our culture, I mean, uh, best example nowadays is the whole legalization of marijuana thing where it's like, you know, how these things are thought about, how, how people feel about it is so tied to how people talk about it. And if it's talked about as this really scary, dangerous thing, like, guess what? Like, it, ma- it magically becomes that. Whereas that when people start saying stuff like, well, no one's like, no one gets into fights and, and you know, no one gets into gunfights and stuff or whatever, like, tend to not be violent under the influence of marijuana. Like, what are they really doing? And yeah. it's like, oh, oh, okay, this is boring. All right, it's legal now. Yeah, exactly. I read some historian who said that people absolutely did sober up in Western Europe when coffee became popular, but he said that coffee became popular in the 1700s, and I know that the gin craze in England was in the 1800s, so that's not quite true. Hmm. (laughs) There can be more than one thing going on at a time. (laughs) Most definitely. (laughs) So it wouldn't be smart mouth if we didn't also talk about the really upsetting side of any particular industry. And coffee, as with so many other agricultural products that we enjoy now, rose to prominence partly because of slavery. At least partly. After Western Europeans got a taste for it, they brought it to the plantations in the Caribbean and made the slaves grow it. Yeah, absolutely. A a lot of the traditions when we look at Europe specifically regarding coffee are very much tied to uh, colonization history. Because as we know, it's almost like once you got to a certain point in history and and Europe had enough boats, you know, ships to to go conquer foreign lands, then all of a sudden it was like the world was this buffet <laughs> to just be plundered. Oh and what's God, really interesting yes. is to notice that, for instance, with France and with Italy, in, when it comes to Africa, they colonized more of West Africa, whereas East Africa was more colonized by Germany. And then you have, again, Dutch, like kind of like, oh, well, you guys 
took all the fun stuff. We're going to go run over to like, you know, Southeast Asia or whatever. <laughs> but the point is that Ethiopia, East Africa is where the good coffee grows. West Africa, there is coffee, but it's not really what we consider export quality. That's why there's French roast. That's why there's espresso. Because both those methods were really originally about making bad coffee taste less bad. Oh, interesting. Whereas for, for Germany, like Germany, you don't hear about German coffee that much. But if you talk to a German and you talk about like, I heard coffee's good in German, Germany. They'll, per, you know, they'll, their back will get even straighter than a regular German person. <laughs> and they'll get all excited because it's a thing that is sort of like a best kept secret. But it's really because they've been used to having those, you know, colonial ties. And so they're accustomed to just better quality coffee. They didn't have to invent some weird, like messed up way of brewing coffee like France did with French roast and Italy did with espresso. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, this is, this, the, the espresso part is a little bit debated, but I, I personally, like, this is one of those things for me, I, I stand by that as like one of, the, one of the origins of it for sure. Oh, okay. Oh, that, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, like we hear about chicory coffee, like uh-huh. in New Orleans. I mean, that, that comes from a French tradition that was absolutely about when they couldn't get coffee. So they were trying to figure out some substitutes and then people, you know, a lot of it is that people grow accustomed to the taste for things. Mm-hmm. And, and then all of a sudden it's like, that's the new trend. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have read that the Haitian revolution was specifically, I guess like the conditions on coffee plantations were especially bad. And that's where the seeds of the Haitian revolution were hatched was specifically about having to work in coffee. Yeah. They're, they're, it, spe- right nowadays, I, I, we have friends who've been trying to work on, I shouldn't say rehabilitating, but like trying to, like, ha- Haiti geographically has the potential for better coffee than it grows. It's just that, you know, through results of all that's history, that like it kind of sort of been neglected as far as like in a, in a specialty, specialty kind of way. Yeah. And again, one of those things that you can understand where people are like, eh, no, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so... Not only did some people think coffee was addictive or whatever problems that they thought coffee might have. Um, remember how I mentioned Charles II earlier and how he didn't like coffee shops? So in that same era, in 1674, there was a pamphlet written that said it was a humble petition and address of several thousands of buxom good women languishing in extremity of want. The idea behind this pamphlet was that English women were fed up with coffee because coffee was making their husbands impotent. Right. This is, I'll put a link to it in the notes, one of the funniest pieces of writing I've ever read in my life. And I, this was a high point of satire in British culture with Jonathan Swift and whatnot. But let me see. <laughs> Amongst the glories of our native country is a paradise for women. <laughs> the same in our apprehensions can consist in nothing more than the brisk activity of our men who in former ages were justly esteemed the ablest performers in Christendom. But to our unspeakable grief, we find of late a very sensible decay of that old English vigor, our gallants being every way so Frenchified. 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 Ooh, the shade. I'm sorry, the shade. <laughs> They said that the husbands come to their marital beds with, okay, first of all, things that were considered sexy, I think, have changed. But they said they come to the bed with nothing moist but their snotty noses, nothing stiff but their joints, nothing standing but their ears. They pretend coffee will keep them awake, but we find by scurvy experience they sleep quietly enough after it. They went hard. Yikes. That was the Cardi B of the time. Yes, it really was. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, if you read this, if you can actually read the words in front of you, like, Cardi B has nothing on these 16th century horny <laughs> women who are sick of their husbands not performing. There's also hints, too, which, again, I personally love finding out stuff about sex in olden times because this idea that people were puritanical throughout history is wrong. It talks about how, you know, if you're dating someone, you're going to sleep with him, but you'll find out that it's a disappointment if he drinks coffee. So it was like also like a warning to all the young women. Oh, my God. I just love everything about this. I also (laughs) don't believe it was written by a group of horny women. I mean, if it was, that's immaterial. I think it was actually written by a monarchist, 
It was just trying to think of ways to get people to stop going to coffee houses. Yeah, trying to control people, most yeah. definitely. It was yeah. psychological warfare, psyops. Yeah, it was hilarious. Also, a response pamphlet was written that argued that there was no way that English men are impotent. They know this for a fact because they've all got gonorrhea. <laughs> I, I response pamphlet. I love I love that. That's like what do they call those 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 rap songs that are like just meant to insult somebody? Oh, the diss tracks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Oh yeah, I loved all about everything about that little exchange. There's no studies or anything about how coffee actually affects people, is there? If there was anything. That again, like you know, just because of the ways that that information flows, I'm sure there was some truth to it at the time, as far as like some kind of correlation. But again, maybe it was just like a wick, a whiskey dick kind of situation that somehow got blamed on coffee, or maybe the fact that they all had gonorrhea and it gave them <laughs> issues. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that that too. I feel like it's more likely that a woman wrote the response pamphlet because it's such a hilarious diss. Like, it's a self-own. Totally. How do response pamphlets get spread back then? Uh, or like the pamphlets in general? Was I just You just picture like some like newsboy kind of, you know, lad, like read all about <laughs> read, yeah. like passing them out on the streets. That's literally what they did. They passed them out in the streets and they would sometimes post them to public boards. But yeah, that was it. I, you know, pamphlets for me are the original microblogging. Right. When people had something to say and they needed to say it quick and couldn't spend a lot of time or money on it, they'd print a pamphlet. Right. It's like the sub stack of the back then. Yeah. Although my sub stack is very long. It's probably longer <laughs> than pamphlet length. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a long form Twitter, maybe. Right. Or a Tumblr when that was the thing. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So yeah, coffee history for its brief written history has so many twists and turns, many of them salacious. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, one of the things that I think is so interesting is just about how, um, just in terms of brewing, like for instance, the whole thing with instant coffee, like where does instant coffee come from? This idea that like, well, if you think about those movies, like All, All's Quiet on the Western Front about World War One you remember that there was like a little coffee pot attached to people's backpacks. Like that's kind of how it was done back then. Whereas before World War II, industry was able to start doing freeze-dried coffee and instant coffee. And so because the clanking of the pot was considered like not cool, they went ahead and rationed out the instant coffee, which was comparatively terrible. But as these things go and as history goes, that people, the GIs coming home, they had grown accustomed to that flavor. And so then all of a sudden there's like this new market for this thing that didn't exist before World War II. Not really anyway. Yeah. So much of American food history of the last century is about making it for the military and then turning around and selling those military food products to the public and convincing the public that they enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. But, you know, there's like a sort of a fundamental thing about coffee that I always like to talk about, which is that, you know, through the history of coffee that we're talking about, as well as even like more recent developments with like specialty coffee and sort of fancy stuff and this and that, you know, we in the coffee industry can get super precious and a little bit like geeky about some of the minutia and such. And very often people get really proud of themselves for like, oh, I figured out a way to do this or that or whatever. I, I always like to do the reality check, you know, and I say like, you know, it's not you, it's coffee. Like we like coffee, human beings like coffee because it is literally the, the most chemically complex thing that human beings consume is coffee. Uh, yeah. In terms of like flavor compounds, wine has like, you know, uh, two, two, three, four hundred different flavor compounds that we enjoy. You know, coffee has like five to ten times more flavor compounds. The heat, the fact that most of the time it's, it's hot, then creates what we call a retronasal sort of thing where it can kind of come up the back of our nasal cavity and we can s smell it as we're drinking it. And that aroma is, is one of the really appealing things. But fundamentally, being so complex basically means that. Uh, when we're drinking coffee, when we're thinking about it, it sort of defies human comprehension. Like your brain can't really wrap 
it's, you know, itself around what's going on. And so what ends up happening naturally as human beings is that we latch onto things that, that we can talk about. Oh, it's rich. It's deep. It's kind of has a, has a smokiness or it has like a fruitiness or like whatever. And then it starts to take shape a little bit. But the analogy I always use is it's like, imagine like a giant building that's like unfathomably large. But then also when you get close, it's like very detailed and it's like sort of ornateness. To me, coffee is like that. You can stand back and kind of try to take it all in, or you can get deep and then like get close and see the detail, but you can't see both at the same time. And when it comes to the detail, you know, if you're looking at one section, then you're missing a different section kind of thing. So the point is that like when people talk about coffee, very often there's a lot of miscommunication, especially between professionals and non-professionals. And to me, it's just like the coffee is that big. You know, if you and I were looking at a giant painting and I was in one corner, you were in another and you were like, look at this, you know, this part with this little kid bouncing a ball is really cool. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's no kid in this painting. And it's like, we're just in different areas. That would make a lot of sense. But very often when people talk about coffee and they're like, what are you talking about? I don't understand what they mean by this or that. It's really that we're engaging it from a different place. And that just happens to be how complex coffee is. And to some degree on the, on the professional side, one of the, my little things I've come up with is like coffee is so amazing and so complex that you can fuck it up a hundred thousand different ways and people will line up every day for a cup still, you know? <laughs> and again, that's not about the per- people who are making it. That's about coffee itself and the history that you're laying out or that we're talking about just like goes to show like there aren't a lot of things that have a history like that for a number of different reasons, but fundamentally it's that complexity and that's what makes it feel almost like magical that we have it at all that's such a good analogy the art analogy or the building analogy both of them i love that it's frustrating because sometimes we're talking about it like for instance one of the things i talk about is that we have the word coffee Mm -hmm. and that's pretty much it if i said to somebody you know how do you like your cooked beef and someone's like oh i like to put some lettuce and tomato you know pickles onions magic sauce whatever the other person was like, what are you talking about? Why would you ruin the cooked beef that way? Like maybe some salt and pepper, but my goodness, like, are you, what kind of like savage are you? But obviously the first person is talking about hamburger and the second person is talking about some kind of prime grade ribeye. Like, but we don't make that mistake because we have vocabulary. Whereas for coffee, we just have the word coffee. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication when we don't have words to describe like the different sort of like categories of things that are meaningful. Those differences are important and meaningful. That is, I had never thought about that. Interesting. So like, for instance, like there's like this idea that gets thrown around sometimes like, oh, they think their coffee's too good for cream or sugar, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. You know, that comes up sometimes. It's not that they think it's too good for it. It's that it's not designed for that, you know? And, and I would say that even the coffee people, because it's not something that's part of our sort of lexicon or our, uh, the way that our discourse, that even they have a hard time sort of explaining it, but it's not designed for that. Just the same way that, I mean, essentially like some of these more delicate coffees, if you put cream or sugar in it, it doesn't taste good. It doesn't make it better. Whereas there's other coffees, uh, my wife puts it really well. She kind of came up with this idea, Trish did, of like, those, um, those additives like milk, sugar, whatever, either they're a correction or they're a compliment. And a lot of times it's like, I like coffee flavor, but I want it to be creamy and I want it to be sweet. In those situations, it's a compliment. Like it's an additional thing, like a condiment or something where it just enhances it for you and for your, for your enjoyment. Whereas other times it's like, oh, that tastes dank as fuck until I put some milk and sugar in it. And then it kind of tastes less bad. Then, then there's that too. And so I do think that people, ne- no one wants to believe that they're drinking bad coffee. Everyone likes to believe that their choices are good choices. And so that I think contributes to the additional sort of miscommunication, misunderstanding. Yeah, you mentioned coffee people sometimes have a hard time describing things like why some coffees shouldn't have milk or sugar added to them. And as with every industry in this country, there's not a lot of training for things anymore. And if there was more retail training, maybe coffee people could explain it more because I do think that something that happens sometimes is when people go into a more high-end coffee shop and feel uncomfortable. Right, most definitely. And to some degree, like... 
you know, this, here's where Korean dad comes back. Like I look at that setting where there's an uncomfortable customer and then there's a barista trying to explain stuff. Everyone there is uncomfortable, you know, <laughs> everyone there is uncomfortable. And to some degree, the way I think about it is like something's missing. And I think to your point, there is a certain degree of education, but also like, you know, the part of progress is figuring out better ways to articulate stuff, whether that's things like Me Too or Black Lives Matter. Like there's ways that we articulate things that then people who didn't understand before, like, oh, I understand a little bit better now. And, but, you know, the, I don't want to say tragedy, but the fact with the human condition is that we don't always have time to address all the issues of the world. And so I think that the, the curing the discomfort in the coffee house setting tends to be a little bit lower on the list for most people. <laughs> But it is true that you can't go to school for coffee, really. And that's something that you kind of mentioned, like that right now there's a few places. So it, you can go to school in terms of the agricultural side. You can study in Hawaii. You can study in, you know, a lot of where, where they grow coffee, especially. But in terms of like the brewing and like that side of things, there are some schools that are part of companies. Like Italy Cafe in Trieste, Italy has a very famous sort of coffee school. <laughs> Korea has like thousands of coffee schools. So does Japan. It's a long story. It's because they're nerds. We're, we're nerds. We get nerdy. <laughs> Every, for, we Koreans and East Asians, it's like everything's going to be some sort of oppressive educational system, no matter <laughs> what it is. But in the States right now, sort of like there, again, has been some agriculture related, development related work like down at Texas A&M University at the Borlaug Institute. But the one that's sort of the bright and shining star right now is at UC Davis, not too far from here in Northern California. They, do, they have a wine center. They have a beer center. They do a lot of cheese, a lot of agriculture stuff, Aggies, you know. But yeah. um, they are just now have started over the past couple of years a coffee center and that we're hoping to see more and more research come from there which in turn sort of helps to sort of be the building blocks of the foundation for just additional sort of pedagogy and education and just knowledge building overall. Yeah. UC Davis is an amazing agricultural school and sometimes I wish I had gone there. <laughs> as long as they have BAs in agriculture and not BSs. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, Nick, thank you so much for talking about coffee and also your new TikTok fame with me. This has been wonderful. Likewise. Thanks so much. Uh, it's been fun. Like I, I was listening to so some of my friends on on your podcast in the past. I'm like, oh, this is just sort of like a, I get to talk to my friends through you. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Yeah. I'm just the deliverer of the news. <laughs> By um, proxy. Yeah, exactly. Where can people find all of your social medias? Yeah, wow. So on Twitter, I'm Nick Cho, N-I-C-K-C-H-O. On Instagram, for now, I'm Nick Cho underscore. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> you know what that means. Uh, <laughs> on, on TikTok, I'm Your Korean Dad. Y-O-U-R, not one of the other yours. And yeah, that's where people can find me. Perfect. Maybe TV screens someday maybe oh my goodness fingers crossed if that's what you want yeah we'll see awesome. thank you so much <laughs> Everybody, thank you for listening. This show is brought to you by Wunder Quark. It's a dairy product that's super popular in European and Central Asian diets. It's technically a soft cheese, but it really resembles like a really thick yogurt. You can eat it plain like I do. I think it makes a great breakfast because it tastes good. It's super filling and it has um, up to 24 grams of protein for every eight ounces. Also, it doesn't separate when it gets hot, so you can use it in cooking and baking too. 
A brand called Wunder has been selling Quark in the U.S. So if you'd like to try it, go to WunderCreamery.com and enter code SMARTMOUTH for 15% off on your first order. That's WunderCreamery.com. Use code SMARTMOUTH, one word. Following are the sources I used for this episode. The BBC, the book Folklore in the Holy Land, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish which was published in 1907, Uh, a more recent book called The World of Caffeine, The Science and Culture of the World's Most Popular Drug. I also referenced a paper in GeoJournal titled The Worlds of Tea and Coffee, Patterns of Consumption. Another paper called Suave Molecules of Mocha, Coffee Chemistry and Civilization from New Partisan, a Journal of Culture, Arts and Politics. Uh, Also, a paper called The Early History of Ethiopia's Coffee Trade and the Rise of Shawa from the Journal of African History. And finally, my beloved pamphlet, The Women's Petition Against Coffee, representing to public consideration the grand inconveniences accruing to their sex from the excessive use of that drying, enfeebling liquor. (laughs) Links are in the show notes and at smartmouthpodcast.com. Join me on Instagram at smartmouthpodcast. The Patreon is at patreon.com slash smartmouthpodcast. And the newsletter is smartmouth.substack.com. Smartmouth is a production of Table Cakes, a woman-owned Los Angeles-based podcast company. Smartmouth is hosted and produced by me, Catherine Spires, and engineered by Mika Grimm. Check out all of our shows at tablecakes.com. A Table Cakes production. <laughs>